On June 4, 1918, I again encountered the regiment, camped for rest in the village of Rocher, now pushed behind the front line. The new commander, Major von Lutti Cho, had given me command of my 7th Company. As I approached the apartments, the men ran out to meet me, snatched up their belongings and greeted me with triumph. I seemed to be back in my family circle. We lived in a kraal made up of corrugated iron barracks, in the midst of densely overgrown meadows, in the green of which countless yellow flowers shimmered. The desolate plain, christened by us gelding land, was filled with herds of grazing horses. One who stepped outside his hut felt at once the sucking feeling of emptiness that must at times overwhelm the cowboy, the Bedouin and other desert dwellers. In the evenings we took long walks around the barracks in search of nests of grouse eggs or military equipment hidden in the grass. One afternoon I rode through a hollow near Vraqueur, which until two months ago had been the scene of fierce fighting. Its outskirts were strewn with graves, on which I repeatedly came across familiar names. Soon the regiment received orders to take the front line of the position defending the village of Puiget or Quant. At night we travelled by truck to Achilles Grandes. We had to stop frequently, for the bright balls of glowing parachute bombs from the night bombers picked out of the darkness, the white ribbon of road. Everywhere the varied hoosh of flying heavy shells was overlapped by the thunderous booms of bursts. Searchlights tentatively groped the dark sky in search of night vultures. Shrapnel bloomed like a delicate toy, and tracer bullets rushed one after another in long links like a pack of flaming wolves. A persistent corpse odour hung over the captured land, more or less overpowering the mind, like a greeting from some ghastly land. The smell of the offensive. I heard the voice of an old frontline soldier beside me as we rode for some time, as it seemed to me, along the avenue of mass graves. From Ashila Grand, we followed the railroad embankment leading to Baypom, and then across the field to the position. The fire was in full swing. When we stopped for a moment for a breather, two medium shells burst nearby. The memory of the nightmarish night of March 19 made us drag our feet. Just behind the front line was a shifting, noisily galloping company. Chance led us past it just at the moment when a dozen shrapnel bursts cut off the noise. With a desperate muttering, my men fell into the nearest trench. Three bleeding had to return to the sanitary dugout. Day at three o'clock, completely exhausted. I found myself in my dugout, the excruciating cramped conditions of which promised me a series of unappealing days in the near future. The reddish flame of a candle wavered in a dense cloud of smoke. I scrambled over someone's legs, awakening life in the hole with the magic word change. From the furnace-like hole came a torrent of curses. Then came an unshaven face, pitted shoulders, a dilapidated uniform, and two clay stumps I recognised as boots. We sat down at a rickety table and settled the transfer business, each trying to cheat the other out of a dozen or two rations or a few rockets. At last, my predecessor squeezed himself out through the narrow neck of the adit, prophesying to me that the nasty hole wouldn't last three days, and I was left as the new commander of Site A. It's the position which I inspected the next day did not please me much. Just outside the dugout I met two bloody men on duty, wounded on the approach by a charge of shrapnel. A few paces later Gunner Ahrens was added to them, hit by a ricochet. In front of us was the village of Bukwai, with Puisia Oxmont behind us. The company occupied an unechonized position in a narrow front line and was separated on the right from the 76th Infantry Regiment by a large, unoccupied waste. The left wing of the regimental section was flanked by a rugged, wooded area. Grove 125. According to the order, there were no tunnels. We lived two by two in tiny dugouts, propped up by the so-called tin plate Siegfried. It was a bent in an arc corrugated tin, about a metre high. Its sheets we propped up our narrow, crawlway-like shelters. Since my dugout was in a completely different area, the first thing I did was to look for a new dwelling. A hut-like structure in an abandoned trench seemed quite tolerable to me, after I had put all the deadly equipment I had brought there into a defensible condition. There, with my clerk, I led the life of a hermit in nature, only occasionally interrupted by the arrival of liaisons and ordinaries, who themselves carried detailed front newspapers to this secluded cave. Thus, between the explosions of two shells, among other useful news, it was possible to read the news that the commandant of the place X ran away a black-spotted terrier, which answers to the name of Zippy, or not without a sense of dark humour, to delve into the reading of the alimony suit of the maid Makebee against the sergeant mayor.
All sorts of cartoons and urgent messages provided the necessary variety. Let us return, however, to my refuge, to which I had assigned a beautiful name of Dream House. All I cared about was the canopy of the shelter, which only relatively protected me from shells, that is, as long as there was no direct hit. The only consolation was the thought that my men were not in a better position. Every midday, the clerk would lay down a blanket for me in the giant funnel to which we had dug a passage to sunbathe there. Sometimes my lying in the sun was disturbed by the close burst of a shell or the buzzing of shrapnel flying overhead from the enemy's aerial bombardment. The night bombardments fell on us with short, violent summer thunderstorms. During them I would lie on the freshly grassed bunks with a peculiar, unknown sense of security and listen to the nearby bursts, from which sand streamed down the shaking walls, or I would go outside and look from my post at the sad night landscape, which was an inexpressibly strange contrast to the dances of the fire in which it served as an arena. At these moments a feeling crept into me that had hitherto been foreign to me, a profound change in the feeling of war, derived from a life lingering on the edge of the abyss. The seasons were changing, winter came and summer again, and the fighting was still going on. Everyone was tired and accustomed to the countenance of war, but it was this habit that made everyone see everything that was happening in a completely different, dim light. No one was blinded any more by the power of its manifestations. It was felt that the sense with which they had entered into it, it dried up and was no longer satisfying, while the struggle demanded more and more severe sacrifices. The war threw up more and more complex riddles. It was a strange time. The front line had to suffer relatively little from enemy fire. It was clear to the enemy, one way or another we cannot hold it. Mainly Poesia and the neighbouring hollows were under fire, growing in the evenings to squalls of incredible density. Two deliveries and shifts were thus exposed to special danger. Here and there some link in our chain was torn out by an accidental hit. On June 14 at 2am, I was replaced by Kias, who also returned and commanded the second company. We spent the lull hours at the Ashili Grand Railroad embankment which protected our barracks and dugouts from fire. The British often used heavy low fire, of which field officer Rakebrand of the third company also fell a victim. He was killed by a piece of shrapnel, which pierced the thin wall of a rudely built barrack on the crest of the embankment where he had set up his office. A few days earlier a great misfortune had already happened. A pilot had dropped a bomb directly into a group of trainees surrounding the band of the 76th Infantry Regiment. Among the dead were many from our regiment. Near the railroad bed, like ships washed ashore, lay numerous charred tanks. During my walks I studied them carefully. Sometimes near them I gathered my company for classes to study the defences, tactics and vulnerabilities of these increasingly technical battle elephants. Some bore funny, menacing or lucky names, symbols and battle colouring. There was a clover leaf, a lucky pig, and a white dead head. There was even a gallows from which dangled an open noose. The tank was called Judge Jeffreys, but they were all badly set up. Narrow, open to shots, armoured turret with a stuffing of tubes. Rods and wires in combat was extremely uncomfortable place to stay. When the Colossi, trying to dodge artillery fire, like clumsy giant beetles, rolled in an arc across the battlefield, I vividly imagined these men in a fiery oven. In addition, the area was dotted with many hulks of burned-out airplanes, an indication that the machines were increasingly involved in combat. One afternoon, a giant white parachute dome opened near us, with which the pilot had jumped out of his burning airplane. On the morning of June 18, the 7th Company, in view of the uncertainty of the situation, was already moving again to Pusia to be placed at the disposal of the troop commander for tactical movements and movement of equipment. We occupied the cellars and adits located at the Bukwai exit. As soon as we arrived, a group of shells hit the surrounding gardens. Even so, I could not refuse breakfast in the little gazebo at the entrance to my adit. After a while, the approaching whistle was heard again. I threw myself on the ground. Nearby flames broke out. A corpsman of my company named Kenzioro who had just brought several cauldrons of water, collapsed wounded in his lower abdomen. I ran up to him, and with the help of one signalman dragged him to the sanitary adit, the entrance to which, fortunately, was right near the explosion site. Well, did you have a good breakfast? asked Dr. Keppen, an old army doctor in whose hands I'd been more than once, dressing Kenziora's large stomach wound. Yes, a pot full of noodles whimpered the wretched man, catching at least a spark of hope. Well, well, everything will be all right, Keppen consoled him, 
nodding to me with a look of great doubt on his face. But the badly wounded are hard to deceive. Suddenly he groaned loudly, large drops of sweat beating on his forehead. The bullet is fatal. I know that for a fact. In spite of such a prophecy, six months later I shook his hand on entering Hannah. In the afternoon I took a lonely walk through the utterly ruined Puigia. The village had been ground into a heap of ruins in the summer battles. The craters and the remains of the walls were thickly overgrown with greenery, and everywhere the white caps of the elderberry trees that had taken possession of the ruins shone out of it. Numerous fresh sinkholes had torn up this stilted cover, and again exposed the ground that had already been ploughed over many times. The village street was strewn with all manner of military debris of the faded offensive. Broken wagons, discarded ammunition, melee weapons that had lost their shape, half-decomposed corpses of horses, surrounded by swarms of swarming flies, were a vivid testimony to the perishability of all things in life and in battle. The church on the high ground was a heap of desolate ruins. While I was plucking wild roses, shells bursting nearby reminded me to be careful where death danced. A few days later we replaced the Ninth Company on the main line of defence, which lay about 500 yards from the front line. In doing so several men of my seventh were wounded. The next morning near my dugout Captain von Liedeber was wounded in the foot by a shrapnel bullet. Suffering from lung disease, he knew his business in battle. And now he was destined to die from an insignificant wound. Soon he died in the infirmary. On the 28th a grenade shrapnel killed the senior food delivery sergeant Grenner. This was the ninth loss in the company in such a short time. The picture was becoming more and more animated. The British and Germans surrounded us and demanded that we drop our weapons. There was confusion like a sinking ship. In a weak voice I encouraged those standing nearby to fight. They were firing at their own and at strangers. Our handful were surrounded by mute silence and shouts. The two mighty Englishmen on the left were plunging their bayonets into the trench, whence hands were reaching out to them pleadingly. And below us shrill voices began to break out. No point, take off your guns, don't shoot. I glanced at the two officers standing beside me in the trench. They smiled helplessly in response and threw their harnesses to the ground. The only choice now was between capture and a bullet. I crawled out of the trench and staggered toward Favreil, as if in a terrible dream, I felt my feet sticking to the ground. The only thing that might have been to my advantage was the confusion, during which some of the people had already exchanged cigarettes, while others were again massacring each other. The two Englishmen who had brought a detachment of the captured 99th to the line stood against me. Painting my pistol at the nearer man, I pulled the trigger. He went down like a figure in a shooting gallery. The other discharged his rifle at me but missed. The quick movements sharply pushed the blood out of my lungs. I breathed more freely and began to make my way along the trench. Behind one crossbar hid Lieutenant Schlager and his firing squad. They joined me. Except for me, Schlieger and two others, all were killed. The nearsighted Schlieger, who had lost his glasses as he told me later, could see nothing but my bouncing clipboard. Because of the great loss of blood, I felt free and slightly groggy. My only concern was the thought of not falling too soon. At last we reached an earthen mound in the shape of a crescent to the right of Favreau Isle, from which a half dozen machine guns were spewing fire at our own and the strangers. So here was a gap, or at least an island in our midst. Luck had not changed us. Enemy bullets spattered the sand of the fortification. Officers shouted, excited men rushed in different directions. The orderly officer of the 6th Company tore off my uniform and told me to lie down at once, for every minute I might bleed to death. I was wrapped in a trench coat and dragged along the eastern edge of Favreil. Several men from my 6th Company accompanied me. The village was already swarming with Englishmen, and not surprisingly their fire was not long in coming. The shots rattling struck human bodies. Orderly Six, who was holding the back end of my tarp, was knocked to the ground by a shot to the head. I fell with him. The small group sprawled on the ground and, spurred on by the blows, crawled to the nearest depression. I was alone in the field, rolled up in a tarpaulin, and waited almost indifferently for the blow that would end this odyssey. However, even in this desperate situation I was not abandoned. The companions followed me and again made an attempt to rescue me. Near me came the voice of F. Lieutenant Nant Hengstman, a long, fair-haired lad from Lower Saxony. I'll take her attempt on my back. We'll get through or go down. Too many guns stood on the edge of the village. Hengstman ran while I put both arms around his neck. 
Immediately the firing went up as at a firing range, when they aim at a target a hundred meters away, and a thin metallic buzzing sound announced the shot that sent Hanksman's body collapsing beneath me. He fell silently, but I felt death take hold of him before we touched the ground. I freed myself from his hands, which still held me tightly, and saw that the bullet had pierced his helmet and temple. The daredevil was the son of a teacher from Letter near Hanover. As soon as I could walk again, I sought out his parents and told them everything. This failed example did not prevent another attendant from making another attempt to save me. It was Corpsman Sergeant Stuchelski. He took me on his shoulders and carried me, though the swarm of bullets was circling us again, to a quiet corner of the next height. It grew dark. The men found the tarpaulin with the dead man and carried me across the lonely plain, on which the stars flashed with a prickly glow near and far. I felt for the first time how awful it is to feel suffocated. The smell of a cigarette being smoked by a man ten paces away almost choked me. At last we reached the sanitary dugout, where my good acquaintance Dr. Kai was doing his service. He mixed me a delicious drink with lemon and gave me a shot of morphine, which put me into a healing sleep. The next day began the usual divided transportation. The jolt in the automobile to the military infirmary was the last severe test of my ability to survive. I then entered the arms of the sisters and continued reading Tristram Shandy, where he was interrupted by orders to come forward. Many acts of engagement brought me relief during the crisis characteristic of lung wounds. Soldiers and division commanders visited me. The participants in the assault on Sapinier were all, of course, either dead or were, like Chius in English captivity, the Planco couple, though already the first shells of the advancing enemy were tearing into Cambrai, sent me a nice letter, a can of milk torn from themselves, and a single melon all that was in their garden. My last attendant was no exception to the long line of his predecessors. He remained with me, though he had no rations in the infirmary and had to beg for food in the kitchen. When you are bored lying down, you look for all sorts of ways to unwind. So one day I spent my time counting my wounds. I found that, not counting such trifles as ricochets and scratches, I had been hit fourteen times in all, namely five rifle shots, two shell fragments, four hand grenades, one shrapnel bullet, and two bullet fragments, the entrance and exit wounds of which left me twenty scars. In this war, where spaces rather than individuals were under fire, I was honoured that eleven of these shots were meant for me personally, and so I rightfully pinned on my chest the gold badge of the wounded awarded to me in those days. Fourteen days later, I was lying on the soft bed of an ambulance train. Already the German landscape appeared in the first glimpses of fall. Fortunately, we were unloaded at Hanover and sent to the Clementine shelter. Among the many visitors who soon appeared, I was especially pleased with my brother. He had still grown since his injury. His right, badly scarred side of his body, however, was inactive. I shared my room with a young military pilot of the Richthofen squadron named Wenzel, one of those tall, desperate lads that Germany still gives birth to. He honoured his squadron's motto, I'm Ron but mad, and destroyed twelve opponents in aerial combat, the last of whom shot him in the shoulder before he died. I celebrated my first outing with him, my brother, and a few comrades awaiting transport in the halls of the old Hanover Guards Regiment. As our fighting ability was now in doubt, we felt an urgent need to exercise the heavy chair. Wenzel broke his arm, and I was in bed the next day with a temperature of 40. Moreover, the temperature curve even made several risky leaps to the red line, beyond which the art of physicians is powerless. At such a temperature, the sense of time disappears. While the sisters struggled for me, I lay in feverish dreams, many of which are even very cheerful. On one of these days, it was September 22, 1918, I received the following telegram. His Majesty, the Kaiser awards you the Order of Courage. I congratulate you on behalf of the entire division. General von Basset. In the courtyard at a table made up of a cart and the front door, Skrader and I ate dinner and drank a bottle of wine. Then we piled into our goat stable until a sentry informed us at two o'clock in the morning that the trucks were standing ready in the market square. In the ghostly light we rumbled over terrain torn up by last year's fighting at Camber and rolled through streets of villages burned to the ground by piles of ruins. At Benny we were unloaded and brought to our position. The battalion occupied a hollow near the Benevo Highway. In the morning a liaison brought orders that the company was to advance to the Fremicourt Vork Highway. 
This sporadic movement made it clear that before evening we were to see much blood. In twisting ranks I led the three platoons over terrain that the circling airplanes were pelting with bombs and shells. At our objective we spread out in craters and dugouts as individual shells flew across the road. During these days I felt so bad that I immediately lay down in a small trench and fell asleep. When I awoke I read Tristram Shandy, whom I carried with me in a tablet, and so, lying in the warm sunshine, I spent the second half of the day with the indifference of a sick man. At six, 15 p.m., the liaison called the company commanders to Captain Von Wy. We are recounted you an important message. We are advancing. After half an hour of artillery preparation at seven o'clock, the battalion begins the assault at the western edge of Fevriol. The point of departure is the Seppin Bell Tower. After exchanging brief words and shaking hands firmly, we rushed to our companies, for the fire was to start in ten minutes, and we still had a long way to go. I notified my platoons and ordered them to move out. Groups in rows, one at a time, distance twenty meters, direction half turn left into the Favreal trees. It was a good sign of the spirit still alive in the men that I had to choose who to stay behind to notify the field kitchen. Not a single volunteer showed up. It with my company staff and field fleet Rianeki, who the terrain well, went far ahead. Behind hedges and ruined shells from our guns were flying out. The fire was more like an angry bark than a destructive assault barrage. Behind me, my squads moved forward in exemplary order. Aerial bullets kicked up clouds of dust around them. Shrapnel charges, shells and carrier plates filled all the space between the narrow chains of men with an infernal hiss. On the right was the hard-fired Benyata, from which jagged pieces of iron flew out with a heavy thud, and with a short thump they slammed to the clay ground. It became even more uncomfortable on the march beyond the Benyata Bapom Highway. Suddenly several brisant shells exploded between us and behind us. We scattered to the craters. I stuck my knee into the product of the fear of my predecessor who had once passed here, and told the clerk to hastily clean me up at least a little with a knife. On the edge of the village of Favreil, the clouds of ruptures were furtive. Between them columns of brown earth rose and fell hurriedly. To find a position, I went forward alone to the nearest ruins, and signalled with my cane to follow me. The village was dotted with burned barracks, behind which the first and second battalions gradually gathered. On the last stretch of road a machine gun suddenly spoke. From my position I could see a thin chain of rising clouds, and from time to time some of the approaching men were caught in it like a net. Among others, Vice Phil Feebel Baug of my company was shot through the leg. A figure in brown corduroy crossed the shelled area indifferently and shook my hand. Caius and Boyer, Captains Junker and Shaper, Schrader, Schlieger, Heinz, Findy Izen, Hellerman and Hoppenroth stood behind the lead and iron pierced hedge and for the thousandth time judged and argued about the offensive. We had fought so many times on the field of cruel battle, and now again the low sun was about to illuminate the blood of almost all of us. Parts of the 1st Battalion entered the castle park. Of the 2nd Battalion, only my company and the 5th Company relatively as a whole passed the curtain of fire. We advanced through the craters and ruins of houses to a hollow on the western edge of the village. On the way, I picked up my helmet from the ground to put it on my head, something I only did in very dangerous circumstances. To my surprise, the village of Favriweel turned out to be completely dead. By all indications, the command had abandoned the defences for a strange spirit of uneasiness. Peculiar at such times to places abandoned by their masters was already hovering over the ruins. According to Captain Von Wy's orders, at this time lonely and badly wounded, he was already lying in one of the funnels of the village, which we did not realise. The 5th and 8th companies were to attack on the front, the 6th on the 2nd and the 7th on the 3rd line. As neither the 6th nor the 8th company was yet to be seen, I decided to advance without caring for the disposition. It was now seven o'clock. From my position, from behind the remains of houses and broken trees, I saw a line of riflemen come into the open field under a weak fire. It must have been the fifth company. Under the cover of the hollow, I prepared a command to attack and gave the order to advance in two ranks. Distance one hundred metres. I myself will be between the first and second ranks. This was the final assault. How often in past years we had marched westward towards the sun like that. Les Epargues, Ylement, St. Pierre Waste, Langemark, Parchendale, Mouvre, Vaucourt, Maury. And once again the bloody feast 
We left the hollow as if on a formation, except that myself, as the beautiful wording in the order read, found myself suddenly beside Lieutenant Schrader in front of the first rank in the open field. My condition had improved a little, but I still felt somehow strange. Later Haller, bidding me farewell before his departure for South America, told me that his neighbour remarked at the time. Listen, it looks like the lieutenant's going to get that amazing man, whose exuberant and destructive temperament I loved, revealed to my surprise that the heart of a commander is judged by the common man on the most accurate scales. I actually felt weak and considered the attack lost from the beginning, and yet I love to remember it. It did not have the boiling excitement of a great battle. Instead, I had a feeling of complete detachment, as if I was watching myself from the outside through binoculars. For the first time in the war, I heard the whirring of small bullets whizzing past me like an inanimate object. The landscape took on a glassy transparency. There were still isolated shots in our direction. Probably we were not too clearly visible against the ruins of the village. With my cane in my right hand and my pistol in my left, I walked forward with heavy footsteps and, without noticing it, left the firing line of the 5th Company partly behind and partly to my right. As I advanced, I felt my iron cross detached from my breast and dropped to the ground, Trader, my clerk, and I began to search for it diligently, though the sheltered gunners had probably already taken us at gunpoint. At last Schrader pulled him out of the grass and I reattached him to my breast. The terrain went down a slope. Vague figures moved against the red-brown clay. A machine gun met us with a fan of fire. The feeling of hopelessness grew stronger. Still, we ran while being pelted with fire. We jumped over several trenches and hastily dug pieces of trenches. Just as I was in a leap over one, more carefully dug trench, a through bullet struck me in the chest, knocking me down like game on the fly with a shrill cry, in the sound of which the very life seemed to come out of me, I twisted several times and crashed to the ground. At last it was my turn, and with this hit I felt as if the bullet had struck my very core. Even on the way to Mori I had felt the breath of death, but now its hand held me in a very clear and formidable way. As I hit the bottom of the trench hard, I realised clearly that this was indeed the end. Yet in a strange way this moment belongs to the few of which I can say that it was a truly happy one. Precisely in some kind of epiphany, I suddenly realised my entire life to its deepest essence. I felt immense surprise that it was about to end, but this surprise was filled with a strange merriment. Then the fire receded somewhere, and as if over a stone, the surface of the rushing waters closed over me. I've often seen wounded men in a death-like oblivion, when neither the noise of battle nor the extreme tension of human passions around them touched them any more, and I can say that I happened to be behind that bale. The time when I was completely unconscious may not have lasted very long. It seems to have been equal to the interval in which our first wave of attackers reached the trench into which I fell. I awoke with a sense of great distress, wedged between two walls of clay, a shout of orderly. The company commander is wounded, slid along the chain of bent men, an elderly man from another company bent over me compassionately, freed me from my harness and unbuttoned my uniform. Two bloody spots protruded in circles on my right breast and back. A feeling of stiffening heaviness pulled me toward the ground. The hot air of the narrow trench brought an agonizing sweat to his body. A caring assistant refreshed me by waving my clipboard. Gasping for breath, I waited impatiently for darkness. Suddenly a barrage of fire rumbled out of Sapinje. No doubt those ceaseless booms, measured roars, and jolts were more than just a reflection of our so poorly launched attack. I looked down into the petrified face of Lieutenant Schrader, who, like a machine, was firing and charging again. A conversation took place between us that reminded me of the scene in the tower from the Maid of Orleans. However, I did not care about jokes. I clearly understood that everything is over. Schrader could only occasionally throw me a few curt words. Now I didn't count. In a feeling of utter helplessness, I tried to read on his face how it was up there. It was evident from everything that the counter-attackers were winning. I could hear him calling the attention of the men around him more and more frequently and fiercely to the targets, which must have been getting closer and closer. Suddenly, like a dam collapsing in a flood, came a cry of terror. They have broken through on the left. We are dead. In that awful instant, I felt the life force flare up in me again like a spark. I managed to get two fingers into a hand-height hole, made in the wall of the trench by a mouse or a mole. I rose slowly 
The blood that had accumulated in my lungs flowed from the wounds. As it flowed out, I felt a sense of relief. With my head uncovered and my uniform open, pistol in hand, I stared at the battle. Tree, the whitish puffs of smoke a chain of men in full battle gear, was running straight at us. Some fell and stayed down, others rolled over like shot rabbits. A hundred meters before us, the craters swallowed up the rest. It must have been a very young troop. They showed a zeal peculiar to inexperience. As by a thread, four tanks crept along the crest of the hill. In a few minutes they were trampled to the ground by artillery. One collapsed in half like a tin toy. On the right, staggering, sank to the ground with a death cry for Nenyunka Mormon. He was as brave as a young lion. I knew that from Cambrai. He was put down by a shot straight through the forehead, aimed more accurately than the wound from which he had dressed me. In the case, it seemed, was not yet lost. I wheezed to Fenrich Wilski to crawl to the left and plug the breach with his machine gun. He came back very quickly and reported that twenty metres away everything was already occupied. There were units of a completely different regiment there. Up to this point I had been standing holding on to a tuft of grass with my left hand, like a steering wheel. Now I was able to turn, and a strange picture was revealed to me. The English had partly penetrated the section of the trench on the left adjacent to ours, and partly were moving along it with bayonets at the ready. Hardly had I realised the nearness of the danger, when a new and still more unexpected surprise stunned me. Behind my back the attackers were still moving, it was the prisoners being led towards us with their arms raised, so the enemy had penetrated into the village almost immediately after we had gone to the assault. Now the sack was tightened, he had cut us off from his compounds. In a hurry, while the artillery fire was beginning, I gave the necessary orders, made up the two squads, and exchanged a few words with Voigt, who was speaking, according to orders, in a few minutes. As this affair seemed rather like an evening stroll, I, in my cap, with the handle of a grenade under my arm, marched behind my detachments. At the moment of the attack, the guns of the whole area were pointed at the Heckengraben trench, crouching down. We jumped from one crossbar to the other, all going well. The British fled to the rear line, leaving one killed. To explain the episode that followed, it will be recalled that we were not advancing in position, but in one of the many trenches on the approaches on which the British, or rather the New Zealanders, were entrenched. It was only after the war, thanks to letters from the enemy's countries, that I learned that we were fighting against the New Zealand contingent. On the approaches this trench, namely the Heckengraben Trench, ran along the crest of the heights, parallel to the lowland trench lying on the left at the bottom of the gully. The lowland trench, which Viet and I had attacked on July 22, was known to have been abandoned by the detachment we had left there, meaning that it was now occupied by the New Zealanders. The two roads were connected by transverse trenches, Meanwhile, from the depth of the Heckengraben trench, the hollow was not visible. So I marched, trailing the advancing detachment, and was in fine spirits, for, as far as the enemy were concerned, I had hitherto seen only their fleeing figures along the covers. In front of me, non-commissioned officer Meyer was trailing his group, and in front of him, in the windings of the trenches, little Wilkek of my company was at times visible. In this order, we passed a narrow trench, which rose out of a ravine and forked into the Heckengraben. Its two entrances, like a delta, were separated by a three-metre-high clump of earth. I had just passed the first opening, while Maya was already in front of the second. In branchings of this kind, during trench fighting, it is customary to put double posts in charge of security. Voigt had either missed this or was examining the trench in a hurry. At any rate, I suddenly heard a non-commissioned officer shout in alarm and saw him tear up his rifle and shoot past my head into the second opening of the trench. As I was obstructed by a block of earth, I did not realise what was happening, but it was enough for me to take a step back to look into the first hole. What I saw there stunned, the close at hand, almost at arm's length, stood an athletically built New Zealander. At the same time, from below I heard the shouts of invisible attackers rushing up the slabs to cut us off. This New Zealander, who had improbably appeared behind us, and near whom I stood frozen, was unluckily unaware of my presence. All his attention was concentrated on the non-commissioned officer, and he responded to the latter's shot by throwing a grenade. I saw him tear a limonka from the left side of his breast to throw it after Maya, who was trying to escape death by a forward throw. At the same time I snatched up a hand grenade, the only weapon I had with me, and advanced it in a short arc toward the New Zealander's feet rather than throw it. I did not witness its ascension to heaven, 
for it was the last moment when I could still hope to return to my former position. So I quickly jumped back and saw little Wilksick appear behind me, who had the good sense to evade the New Zealander's throw by leaping past Maya towards me. The iron ache thrown toward us tore through his harness and pants on his ass without hitting him. The barrier that had arisen before us was solid, while Voigt and the other forty assailants were surrounded and annihilated, having no idea of what had happened, which I had witnessed. They felt themselves pinned down. Screams of struggle and multiple explosions notified how dearly they were selling their lives. In an attempt to come to their aid, I led a detachment of Fanunka, non-commissioned officer Mormon forward along the Hecken Grubben. However, an obstacle in the form of a rain of sprinkled Molotov cocktails forced us to halt. One piece of shrapnel flew into my chest and hit my suspender buckle. At the same time, the artillery fire reached an incredible force. The ground was streaming with multicolored smoke, the deafening thud of shells bursting deep in the earth, mingled with a shrill metallic screech like the sound of a circular saw cutting through wood. Iron blocks came dangerously close, and splinters tinkled and swirled between them. In anticipation of an attack, I put on my helmet which was lying nearby and returned with several companions to the struggling trench. Figures appeared above us. We lay down on the unfolded wall of the trench and began to shoot. Near me a very young soldier rubbed the handle of a machine gun with shaking hands. No shot was fired until I snatched the weapon from him. Several of the English fell. Others disappeared in the trench, while the fire became more and more frantic. Our artillery did not seem to care where our own were, or where the strangers were. As I, accompanied by my contact, approached my bunker, something struck the wall between us, tore my helmet from my head with a mighty jerk, and threw me far away. I thought we had been hit by a whole shrapnel charge, and, half-deafened, lay down in my hole against the edge of which a shell struck a few seconds later. It filled the little room with thick smoke, and a long splinter shattered a pickle jar that stood at my feet. To avoid concussion, I crawled out into the trench again and busied myself with spurring the liaisons and the trooper on the vigilance part. It was a ghastly half-hour indeed. The depleted company was once more sifted by death. After the fire had subsided, I walked along the trench, surveyed the damage, and ascertained how many men were left. As a train of fifteen men was too small to defend the stretched line, I assigned Fun in Uncle Mormon and three others to the defence of the barricade, collected in hedge all the debris in the huge crater behind the rear traverse, and ordered all the grenades to be piled there. My plan was to let the attacking enemy into the trench, to then slyly blow him up once from above. In fact, however, all subsequent combat activity was limited to a long firefight with light shells. On July 27, we were replaced by a company of the 164th Regiment. We were utterly exhausted. The company commander was wounded while still on the march. A few days later, my bunker was blown up and my successor was buried under it. We breathed a sigh of relief, leaving behind us, Pusier, rumbling steel thunderstorms of the Great War coming to an end. I, t I Infantry Division, Division Headquarters, 12, 8, 1918, Division Order, by its defence and counterattacks in heavy fighting on 25. 7 against far superior enemy forces rifle regiment, no. 73 once again confirmed its high fame as a brave battle-hardened unit. I recognise this all the more because I know well what high demands are made on the troops of the division, on their endurance and fidelity to duty during prolonged use on a heavy front for the sake of our beloved fatherland. In particular, Lieutenant Junger, who was wounded six times and again set a shining example for officers and crew, again deserves all recognition. Von Bosset, Major General and Division Commander. On July 30, 1918, we stopped for a rest at Sarchilistre, the jewel of the province of Artois, surrounded by the splendour of the waters. A few days later, we were already marching back to Escoja, a dull working class suburb that overshadowed aristocratic Cambra, so to speak. I occupied the front room of a North French workhouse on the Rue de Boucher. The obligatory bulky bed, the main piece of furniture, a fireplace with red and blue glass vases on a beam, a round table, chairs, on the walls unpretentious coloured engravings, vive la classe, souvenir de première communion, postcards, and everything else of the same kind constituted the furnishings of this room. The churchyard was visible through the window. Clear moonlit nights favoured frequent visits of enemy pilots giving an idea of the growth of the enemy's technical superiority. 
Every night a multitude of airplanes hovered over us. They dropped bombs of monstrous explosive power on Cambrai and its suburbs. The thin mosquito singing of the engines and the volleys exchanged by the enemy disturbed me less than the cowardly running of my hosts into the cellar. The day before my arrival, however, a bomb had exploded in front of my window. A deafening explosion, an air wave tossed the master sleeping on my bed to the floor, broke a post on the back of the bed, and scraped the walls of the house from the outside. It was this that gave me a sense of security, for I shared much of the belief of experienced soldiers that the best place to hide was in a fresh crater. After the day off, the drumbeat of drills started again. Plats, classes, formation, discussions and reviews filled most of the day. One day we spent the whole first half of the day passing the sentence of the Court of Honour. Missions again became meagre and of questionable quality. At one time only cucumbers were given for supper, which we dubbed, with appropriately frugal humour, garden sausage. I devoted myself above all to the training of the small strike group, for in the course of the last fighting it became clear to me that a further redistribution of our fighting forces was in progress. In fact, in the attack we could count on only a few men capable of striking a blow of special power. Other participants in general were highly doubtful as a firepower. In this situation it was better to command a determined detachment than a slow company. In my spare time I occupied myself with reading, bathing, shooting and riding. During the day I often spent up to a hundred rounds of ammunition on bottles and tin cans. On horseback rides I came across a mass of dropped leaflets which the enemy propaganda service began to use as ideological weapons. Besides political and militaristic whispers, they contained for the most part descriptions of the wonderful life in English prisoner of war camps. And also between you and me, one of them read how easy it is to get lost in the dark, coming back from chancel work or food distribution. On another, there were even verses by Schiller about a free Britain. These leaflets were flown in favourable winds on balloons over the front line, they were tied together with string and, after a while, released with Bickford cord. The reward of 30 P. Fenix Apis indicated that the army command considered them dangerous. The cost, however, was a burden on the population of the occupied areas. One afternoon I got on my bicycle and rode to Cambrai. The nice old town had become deserted. The stores and coffee houses were closed. The streets seemed extinct despite the protective coloured shafts of people flooding them. Mr. and Mrs. Planko, who had received me so cordially a year before, were heartily pleased at my visit. They told me that life in Cambrai had deteriorated in every respect. They complained especially of the frequent air raids, which forced them to run up and down the stairs several times a night, quarrelling over whether it was better to be killed by a bomb in the upper cellar or by a rubble in the lower. I felt sorry for those old people with their worried faces. A few weeks later, when the cannons began to sound, they had to flee from the house in which they had spent their whole lives. On August 23, about 11 o'clock at night, when I was already sweetly asleep, I was awakened by a heavy knock at the door. A liaison brought the order to attack. Already the day before there had come from the front the deafening booms and heavy blows of an unusually heavy artillery fire, reminding us over duty, food, and maps that we had not to count on the length of our rest. In this distant cloche of cannon thunder, we defined by a sound front word. We quickly packed up and, under a thunderous downpour, moved along the road to Cambrai. The object of the march was Marquion, which we entered about five o'clock. The company was provided with a large yard surrounded by a row of deserted stables, in which everyone was accommodated as best he could, with my only company officer, Lieutenant Schrader, I crawled into a brick cellar which had served, probably in times of peace, as was evidenced by the steady spirit it held, as a shelter for goats, now, however, inhabited only by a few large rats. In the afternoon there was a council of officers, at which we learned that during the night we should position ourselves in readiness for battle on the right of the cambrai Bapom Highway near Benayi. We were warned of an attack by new, fast and manoeuvrable tanks. I was determining the fighting order of my company in a small fruit orchard. Standing under an apple tree, I said a few words to the men surrounding me. Their faces were serious and courageous. What was there to talk about? During these days it had probably come to everyone's attention, though with a gradualness that can only be explained by the fact that in any army besides the military there is also moral unity, that we were sliding down an inclined plane. With each attack the enemy introduced more and more powerful armament. His blows became more and more rapid and weighty. Everyone realized that we could not win any more, 
but the enemy had to see that our fighting spirit was not dead yet. After spending a week on the front line, we were to occupy the main line of defence as well, as the replacement battalion had actually been disbanded due to the Spanish. New sick persons were also being announced daily among our men. In a neighbouring division, the flu was running rampant so badly that an enemy pilot dropped a leaflet saying that if the troops did not get out now, the British would replace them. It became clear to us that the epidemic was spreading more and more on the enemy side. The problem of Russians also became acute. Very young men were dying overnight. At the same time, we had to be on constant alert because over Grove 125, like an ominous cast iron, there was a cloud of black smoke all the time. The shelling was so dense that on a windless afternoon, the explosive gases poisoned part of the 6th Company. Like divers, we had to go down into the tunnels with oxygen machines to extract the unconscious from there. Their faces were crimson, and they were breathing as if in a fever dream. One afternoon, going around my station, I found some buried boxes full of English ammunition. To study the construction of a rifle grenade, I unscrewed it and removed the primer. There was still something inside that I thought was a piston, but when I tried to pick it up with my fingernail, it turned out to be a second fuse. It exploded with a clatter, tearing off the tip of my index finger and making several bloody marks on my face. That same evening, as I stood with the bombers covering my dugout, a heavy shell exploded nearby. We argued about the distance. The bombers called 10, I, 30 meters. To check how true my data were, I began to measure. The result was disappointing. The crater was 22 meters from our dugout. You often make the mistake of underestimating the distance. On July 20, my company and I were again in Pizia. All the afternoon, I stood on the remnant of the wall and contemplated a very suspicious picture of the battle. Grove 125 under heavy fire was shrouded in dense smoke, green and red rockets rising and falling. Occasionally the artillery fire would fall silent, and then the thudding of machine guns and the thudding bursts of grenades could be heard. From where I was standing it all looked more like a game. There was no scale of a big battle, but still one could feel the fierce confrontation between the two iron forces. The grove was a throbbing wound upon which the unseen opponents were concentrated. The two artilleries were playing with it like two predators dividing their prey. They were tormenting the trunks of the oaks, and their fragments flew into the air. There were only a few defenders left in the grove, but they held out for a long time, and, as was evident on this dead plain, became a striking example of the fact that here, as at all times, any clash of struggling forces is a measure of the importance of the men involved. In the evening I was summoned to the duty commander's office, where I learned that the enemy had penetrated the network of our trenches on the left flank. To re-establish a supply lane, Lieutenant Peterson and his assault team were ordered to clear the Heckengraben trench, and my men and I were ordered to clear the parallel approach to the gully. We set out in the morning, but immediately on reaching our assault lines we were met by such infantry fire that we decided to abandon the task for the time being. I ordered to lie down in the Elbing Trench, and in a huge cave-like tunnel I began to fill up the night's backlog. At 11 a.m., I was awakened by the rumble of hand grenades on the left flank, where we were occupying a barricade. I hurried there and got into the usual barricade fight. White clouds of grenade explosions were billowing near the Shantung fortifications. Behind, at a distance of a few crossbeams, the crackle of machine guns could be heard on all sides. And then there were the men jumping, bent over, back and forth. A small attack of the British had already been repulsed, but it cost us one man. Torn by grenade splinters, he lay behind the barricade. In the evening I received orders to return the company to Puisia, where an order awaited me the next morning to take part in a small action. It was to be at 3.40, after a five-minute artillery preparation, to attack the so-called low-lying trench in the section from point K to point zone. The enemy had penetrated it, as well as many other trenches on the approach, and fortified himself behind barricades. Unfortunately, the action for which we Lieutenant Voigt with the shock group, and I with two detachments were intended was probably planned on a map, for the trench at the bottom of the ravine was visible from many places as if it were in the palm of my hand. All this did not please me. In my diary the text of the order is followed by lines like this. I hope to describe it all tomorrow. For lack of time I postpone criticising this order. For now I am here in the bunker of station FF 12 o'clock, at three o'clock they'll come to wake me up. But an order is an order, and so Voigt and I with my men at three.
Forty, we stand in the barely glimmering dawn near the Elbing Trench, ready to move out. We occupy a shallow trench from which, as from a narrow gallery, the gully is visible. At the intended second, it fills with fire and smoke. One of the big sprinters that reached us from this cloak of fire wounded the rifleman Claves in the arm. Here it was the same as I had so many times observed before the attacks. The sight of the men prepared in a false light for the rush, bending low at once, or throwing themselves to the ground under short shots, while the excitement was increasing, a soul-stirring picture, like the formidable, mute ceremonial before a bloody sacrifice. We approached in time and success. A dense veil of shelling enveloped the low-lying trench. Not far from point zone we encountered resistance, which we pelted with grenades. Since we had achieved our goal, and were not eager to fight further, we set up a barricade and put a squad with a machine gun behind it. The only thing I liked in the whole story was the behaviour of the members of the assault group, which reminded me of the venerable Simplicissimo. I saw a new kind of front line, the 1918 volunteers apparently almost unaffected by Prussian drill, but gifted with real militancy. These young daredevils, curly-haired and in winding gear, had a furious quarrel twenty metres from the enemy, for one called the other a rag swearing like lancenecks and boasting unrestrainedly. What a shit you are, shouted the bully at last, and one ran along the trench for another fifty yards. It was afternoon when the barricade squad returned. They had heavy casualties. They couldn't hold out much longer. I left those men alone. It was a wonder that anyone was left alive at all, having travelled in daylight the long sack of the trench in the gully. Despite this and many other counterattacks, the enemy was firmly entrenched on the left flank of our front line and barricaded communications, threatening the main line of resistance. This this time not separated by a neutral strip, the neighbourhood promised lasting discomfort. Clearly, too, the men were not comfortable in their own trenches. On 24 July I went to reconnoitre the new C-section, a segment of the main defence line which I was to take the next day. Lieutenant Gipkens, the company commander, showed me the barricade at the Heckengraben Trench. Interesting because on the side facing the British stood a charred tank, towering over the position like a small steel fort. To discuss the details, we sat down on a small jutting crossbar. In the middle of the conversation, I suddenly felt myself being grabbed and rolled sideways. The next second, a shot shattered the sand of my seat. Hipkins, fortunately, had noticed that a rifle was sticking out of the embrasure of an enemy barricade forty yards away. With his keen artist's eye, he saved my life, for at that distance I would have been hit by any donkey. We had carelessly seated ourselves just at this spot between the two barricades, and were as plainly visible to the English posts as if we were sitting opposite them at a table. Gipkins had acted correctly and quickly. Remembering the incident afterward, I wondered if I would not have had a moment's shock if I had seen the rifle first. I was told that on this seemingly innocuous spot three men of the Ninth Company had been killed by shots to the head. The place was ruinous. In the afternoon a not particularly heavy firefight drew me out of the bunker, where I sat cosily with a book over coffee. Ahead, the sparks of barrage fire were rising measuredly, like the pearls of a necklace. The wounded, who limped back, reported that the British had penetrated on sections B and C into the main line of defence, and on section uh, into the supply lane. Following this came the sad news that Lieutenants Forbeck and Grishaba had fallen while defending their sections, and that Lieutenant Karstner had been severely wounded. Another officer was strangely hit by a ricochet during this action. A piece of shrapnel, without touching the body itself, cut his nipple on his breast like a thin knife. At eight o'clock, Lieutenant Sprenger, who had been wounded in the back by shrapnel, and who was filling in for the commander of the 5th, arrived at my dugout. He took a couple of swigs of the neck piece, also called a telescopic sight, and quoting reverse, Don Rodrigo, went to the dressing station. Behind him, with a bloody arm, came his friend, Lieutenant de Meyer. He confined himself to a much briefer citation. The next morning, we occupied Section C, by then again cleared of the enemy. I found the sappers there, Boyer and Caius with part of the second and Hipkins with the remnants of the Ninth Company. There were eight dead Germans in the trench, two British with South Africa Otago rifles cockades. All were soundly finished by grenade blasts. Their contorted faces showed terrible wounds. I ordered the barricades to be occupied and the trenches cleared. At fourteen. Forty-five, our artillery opened a wildfire on the positions lying in front of us. In doing so, more of our men were hit than the British. 
Misfortune was not long in coming. A cry of orderlies ran down the left side of the trench. Hurrying there in front of the barricade in the Heckengraben trench, I saw a corpse, a shapeless mess, all that remained of my best platoonman. He had been killed by a direct hit from our shell in the lower back. His uniform and shreds of underwear, torn from his body by the blast wave, hung above him in the chopped branches of the white briar hedge that gave the trench its name. I ordered a tarpaulin to be thrown over it, in an effort to keep the men away from the site. Then almost immediately three more men were wounded on the spot. Healers, deafened by the blast, was writhing on the ground. Another had both hands broken at the wrists. As he placed his blood-spattered hands on the shoulders of the orderlies, he staggered backward. The whole group resembled a heroic relief. The aide moved in bent, and the wounded man, though with difficulty, kept upright a young man with black hair and a fine, determined, now marble-white face. I sent liaisons one by one to the command posts and demanded that the fire be urgently adjusted or that artillery officers be sent to the trench. Instead of an answer, another heavy mortar came on, finally turning the trench into a butcher's warehouse. There were bloody scraps everywhere, on which clouds of flies swarmed. At 7.15 came a belated order, from which I learned that at 7.30 a heavy artillery fire would begin, and at 8 o'clock two detachments of the assault company under Voigt, should break through the barricades of the Heckengraben Trench. They should advance to point A and establish communication on the right with the parallel advancing strike group. Two detachments of my company were to occupy the recaptured portions of the trench, 